So if you have your notebooks with you, or if you have um, your notes that were passed out tonight, go ahead and pull those out. And we're going to get started looking and kind of cycling through our second part of our series um, on relationships. Title of tonight's message is Dating versus Courting, Part 2. Pretty creative. I know. Came up with it on my own. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. Pretty impressive. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the second part. See, last week what we did is this, is um, if you guys remember right in the beginning, we talked about dating versus courting. And one of the things that we looked at was how in the world, like in, in, in sin and in rebellion, there really isn't a definition between different types of dating. There's just dating. Like you, you could be dating, you know, a, a person and saving yourself for marriage, not Christian, just kind of the way you were raised and you're out in the world, and that's just what you do, and it's called dating. Or you could be, you know, sleeping around or have multiple partners or, you know, have three girlfriends or six boyfriends at the same time or whatever, and you're still called dating. So what we were trying to do last week is we kind of took um, these two different things and we were trying to separate them. What the Bible has to say about building a relationship versus how it kind of is in the world. And the terminology that we use is we used courting versus dating. Um, and that's not, that's not to say that that's going to be the same terminology you'll hear everywhere. Sometimes you'll hear like Christian dating versus worldly dating or stuff like that. So is the word dating necessarily sin? No. So uh, when you talk to somebody, if somebody says, oh, you know, this is a guy that I'm seeing and we're dating, don't be like, oh, my God, you guys are in a horrid, grotesque sin. Not what that means, all right? Just so you guys are aware. We used that last week so that way we can look at the difference between what the Bible has to say and kind of what we see in the world. Now, there is one thing that I very much want to clear up. Um, I was having a conversation with somebody based on last week's message. And um, anyways, and what happened is, uh, if you guys remember last week, I had mentioned something. And I just really want to make sure that it's clear. I was talking about how uh, your relationship with somebody needs to be for the glory of God. Okay? And we were talking about how when you're with somebody, it's to God's glory. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not supposed to enjoy your relationship. I think that that was pretty clear, okay? Um, because God designed a man and a woman and designed them to be together emotionally, spiritually, physically, and to be able to enjoy each other's company. So when you're fulfilling God's design, you are giving him glory through that, all right? So that's clear. But anyway, so what I wanted to do now is this, is since last week we looked at the differences between courting and dating, and we were kind of separating these two different types of, of relationship styles, and we were looking at um, the outcome of courting versus dating or the attitude of courting versus dating or the method and how they differ and so on. What I'd like to do this week is I'd like to look at two specific things in courting and dating. Is First and foremost, I'd like to look at um, when. When does that happen? And secondly, I'd like to look at how. Just how, how do we accomplish this? Like, Let's just say the timing is correct. How does this kind of go about? So I'm actually going to move this over here. So right off the get-go, I spend a lot of time searching through the Word of God and really in prayer and just kind of talking to God about this entire series before we even started putting it together um, or before we even thought about announcing it. And something that you see all throughout the Bible and all throughout humanity is that we have a lot of similarities in the general areas. There's these big principles, these big kind of foundational, fundamental things that are very similar. And it transcends across every plane. Like physically, we're all kind of the same, generally. Like we'll have a head and two ears and one nose, two eyes, a mouth. You know what I mean? Arms and hair on your head, hopefully. Um, yeah. So uh, physically, we all look kind of the same. Emotionally, it's kind of the same thing. Like, you know, if you insult somebody emotionally, they get offended, you know, or if somebody's really proud and arrogant, nobody really likes to have you as a friend. So even there, generally, we're the same. Even spiritually, there's some universal truths that kind of transcend everything spiritually. Like, for example, my relationship with Jesus is going to be different than your relationship, but we're all called to have a relationship with Christ. If I'm proud, that's sin. And if you're proud, that's sin. But the way that I express my pride is going to be different than the way that you express it. Now, because we have differences in the unique individual things about us, doesn't mean that there's differences in these large fundamental things. Like, for example, if you kill somebody, it's sin. If I kill somebody, not sin. Not true. Okay, so that's universal. All right, so that's kind of the difference between these universal foundational principles and then method is kind of different. So the reason why I'm telling you this is because I spent a bit of time looking through the Word of God. And really talking to God and really just trying to console and figure out, God, is there a formula or an identity that you give to relationships? Like, all right, check this out. This is how it works. You court for three months. 
Then after that, you propose. If she says no, you got two more shots. After that, strikes out. You're done, all right? And then you get married. Uh, you get engaged, actually, and it's two months. And then you get married. And then after two years, three months, and six days, then you will have your first child. No, God didn't design things that way. <laughs> yeah. If he did, it would be really boring. I mean, can you imagine? Um, but every relationship is different. And relationships are different based on a lot of different things. Let, let's kind of start big and work our way down. Let's look at time. The way that they dated several hundred years ago is not the way that we date today, all right? Did you know that in Jewish custom, the man would sit down at this big banquet with the, the woman-to-be, and he would have a glass of wine, and he would offer it to her, and he would say, will you take this cup from me? And he was literally proposing to her in front of family and friends. Do you also realize that at the Last Supper, Jesus sat at the table and held up this glass, and he looked at all of the other men in the room, and he says, will you take this cup from me? He was literally proposing to the future bride, to the church, right there and then. And it was insane. It was awesome. All right? Um, so in different cultures and customs over time, it's different. And then you look at nations. Do you realize that today, in today's time frame, that the way that they get married in India is different than the way that they get married in Europe? And the way that they get married in China is different than the way that they get married in, in Africa? And the way that we get married here in this culture, in this community, is different than right outside of this wall, the way that American marriages and weddings are. And there's not one way that's right or one way that's wrong. It's just different from culture. And then on top of that, it's different from household. Maybe in, in a marriage, what's really important to, to my household, you know, uh, or, or, you know, to my parents or, you know, kind of to the way that I was upraised was, uh, you know, the, the spiritual aspect. Maybe somebody else's really big importance was that, you know, there has to be money because they grew up poor or whatever. But it changes from person to person. Even your wedding day is different. For one family, it's all about the flowers. You got to have the flowers. For another family, it's all about the saramale. If the saramale are not good, nobody's going to give any money, and <laughs> it's just not worth it. Um, you know, consider even our wedding ceremonies, how different they are. Wedding, Romanian wedding ceremony, there's got to be two messages. They got to be about the same thing, okay? Um, they have to be in solid Romanian. You have to be able to be exhausted in the service, and then after that, uh, we have a reception for like six hours and then you walk away with like 30 grand all right great day <laughs> um and then in in the community that we live in in the culture that we live in in the united states wedding ceremonies are a lot shorter praise god um and and wedding receptions are are uh you know it's not like like in romanian weddings like you do all the cooking like in american weddings you just you go somewhere and you pay and then they cook for you because you know it's normal um but it's different. So then as I'm looking through the word of God, the thing that I'm asking God about is this. Is God, is there anywhere in your word other than those big nuggets that kind of describes this, this relationship? And there is. Um, and it talks about it in Song of Solomon. Now, I'm not going to go through a detailed walk through Song of Solomon because it would take us minimum seven messages for sure. Seven different, seven part series. Now, the thing about Song of Solomon is that it is about a relationship between Solomon and his beloved um, but the interesting thing about it is that it's not, in chorea, it's not in chronological order. So it doesn't start with them courting and then them, you know, being you know, together in this relationship and then them engaged and then them, them married. In chapter 1, there's a bedroom scene, all right? So it doesn't start that way. In fact, it's not in chronological order. And I was talking to God about it, and I was just kind of curious. God, why wouldn't you set it in chronological order so that way you can just look at it and follow it? Do you know why? This is the only conclusion I've been able to come up with. As guys, what we do is we love instructions, all right? Not when we build things because we know what we're doing. But I'm saying if we can't figure it out, we go to the user's manual. And as guys, we can't figure out women. So we wish there was a user's manual. There isn't. Okay, so here's the thing. It's a true story. So here's the thing. What would happen if there was a user's manual on relationships, we would do exactly that. We would never bother actually seeking out the relationship. Do you ever wonder if God was going to write a book, which he did, the Bible, why did he write the Bible the way that he wrote it? Why couldn't he have written it in a way to where you start in chapter 1 and then you end in chapter 12, or, you know, maybe not chapter 66, uh, you know, and you end in chapter 12, and when you're done reading it, you are fully convinced that God is real, that he exists, and that you have a relationship with him, and you know how to live the rest of your life. Was he not able? Of course he was. Because in Proverbs it says it is to the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is to the glory of kings to search it out. It's not to God's glory, even though it is, but it's saying it's to God's glory, not necessarily to reveal a matter, but to hide it. 
It's to God's glory to hide something from us. Do you, do you realize what it's saying? I thought it would say to reveal. It says to hide. It's to his glory to hide a matter, and then it's to the glory of kings to search it out. The point isn't the destination. It's about the journey that you're in with Jesus. It's to his glory to say, hey, I'm going to hide this thing out because I want you to search it out. That's the whole idea. If the Bible made 100% sense, uh, 100% in my head, I'd read it once and be done because I'd never have to read it again. I'd never talk to God because I know what to do. But the whole entire point is to have a relationship with him. Song of Solomon is a lot the same way. Because our relationships, you have to be able to search it out. Listen carefully. If your relationship with Jesus is one of these on autopilot kind of relationships where you're just doing the bare minimum and you're scraping by, or you, know, you show up to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, you play in the fanfara, you come to youth nights, you're a part of discipleship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I know, you don't have to tell me, I know that your relationship with him is really flat. I know that. You're never going to have what it is that you want out of a relationship with God until you go for it, until you seek after it. And it's the same thing in a relationship between a man and a woman. It'll just be flat unless you're actively pursuing it. So that's why I think God wrote Song of Solomon that way. Um, but let's, let's go ahead and get started and look through courting uh, and, and when it happens and then how. But I want you to understand this and write this part down. This you have to write down. The foundation to a healthy relationship is a healthy relationship with Christ. Listen to me. The foundation to a healthy relationship is a healthy relationship with Christ. I know that that sounds really cute. It's something, you know, you might want to, oh, you know, we'll write it in the, you know, Precious Moments Bible or something. You know what I mean? Oh, it's, you know, it's so cute and it's so polite and nice and correct and Christian and, you know, probably see it in a bumper sticker somewhere. No, listen, it's not just like ethereal or, or, or uh, something you can't really put your hand on. I'm saying this to you practically. You have to understand how practically I'm saying this to you. The, the basis of a healthy relationship with another human being is a healthy relationship with Christ. You, you have to grasp that. Look, you're going to hear this today, and here's what's going to happen. A bunch of you are going to get married, all right? You're going to get married, you're going to be married, and your relationship with your spouse is going to be difficult at times, especially in the beginning. It's going to be hard. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to start drawing near to God, and God's going to start growing you and building you and changing you and making you more like him. And automatically, sometime like six months later, you're going to notice that your marriage is getting a lot better. And then it's going to hit you and you're going to realize, man, a great relationship with Jesus helps me have a great relationship in my marriage and with my friends and with my family. And you're going to get it and you're going to be like, oh, my God, Eddie, like I heard you say that like a decade ago. But, man, I get it, man. Like I get it. Like a healthy, it's that practical. All right, so please understand that a healthy relationship with Christ is what's going to give you a healthy marriage and a healthy, a healthy courtship and a healthy walk. So courting. Let me define courting. Courting is when you, you find out if you should or should not marry a person. It's really that simple. Courting is the process that we go through to be able to discover if this is the person that we're going to marry and spend the rest of our lives with. When do you begin? When you're ready. All right, good. Good night. That was easy. <laughs> no. Um, when you're ready. Uh, Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, not to his girl, all right, to his wife. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Genesis 2, 24. Notice it doesn't say, therefore, a boy shall leave his mother and father. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become flesh. Listen, if you are incapable of leaving your father and your mother... You're not ready for marriage. It's just that simple, all right? If you are incapable of leaving your father and your mother, and there's a couple of different catalysts that I want to look at. Uh, what does it mean to leave them? It pretty much means to be able to stand on your own and be the foundation of your own sturdy, stable family, all right? And a couple of things that I wanted to look at is, is timing is what it was one of the first ones, all right? I want to look at timing. You guys have heard me say this 100,000 times. If you're on the five-year plan, you're on the wrong plan, okay? If some guy comes to you and says, I caught an amen out of the corner of my eye, and that's hilarious, all right? So, <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah, if you're on the five-year plan, wrong plan, guys, wrong plan. If some guy comes to you or some girl comes to you and is just like, hey, you know, we should kind of, you know, just, you know, 
hook up, that you know what's the Romanian word? We're just talking. Isn't that the Romanian word? We're just talking. I talk to my mom. What is that? Right? I talk to Danny. <laughs> That's what we use, isn't it? So we're just talking. That's like the worst phrase ever because it's so ambiguous. All right? If some guy comes to you and he says, hey, you know, let's, you know, start talking, and he's not ready for marriage for another five years, don't waste your time, all right? Don't waste your time. Just, you know, tell him to go and get his baseball mitt and his baseball glove and go back to, you know, being a kid because he's just not ready to be a man. Amen? Amen. Listen, boys don't marry. Men marry. Boys aren't ready for marriage. Men are ready for marriage. So if you're still a boy, you're just not ready for marriage. Yeah. Timing. If you're in school and you know you're going to be in school for another four years, don't go looking for a relationship if you know you're not going to be ready for it. If you know that the only outcome is the four-year plan because you've got school for another four years, then don't don't bother wasting your time. And let let me say something to you girls especially. If a guy is coming to have a relationship with you and he's courting you and and this and that or he's calling you, he's texting you like at 1130 at night or whatever, um, and he's coming to have a relationship with you and you know that he... The only thing he can do is commit to a, to a five-year plan because he's in school for the next five years. Realize this, that he's not looking for commitment. He's looking for something else because we're logical. If I wanted commitment, I would know I got five years of school, so I'm not going to bother you know, trying to build a relationship with any girl because I got five years of school, so I know that doesn't make any sense. You see, worldly dating says intimacy before commitment. And, and godly courting says commitment before intimacy. Please don't think that you can buy commitment with intimacy. It's never going to work. Amen. You can never buy commitment with intimacy, and that's the lie that most girls feed into. Is you know, if I, if I just give him this, or if I just allow this, or if I just go along with this, then he'll stick around. You realize that you've sold yourself at that point. It doesn't function that way. Timing is super important. If you know that in your life you're not going to be ready, then it just doesn't make any sense to start a relationship. Even if you're 30 and you know you got another decade of school, you understand? And you like this girl and she's got another decade of school. All right? But, But let me say this. Let me say this. I have friends, and I'm just using school as an example, okay? Timing is what I'm talking about. I have friends that um, he was in school, she was in school. They got married, and it was a godly marriage, and it's fantastic, and I'm super proud of them. It was hard because he did school all morning, and then he worked all evening, and she did school all morning, and she worked all evening, and they were barely scraping by. But it was a totally godly Christian thing because they started courting one another, and they had this relationship, and they got married, and even though they were still in school. So for them, it was right timing. So don't get me wrong. Just because you're in school doesn't mean you can't get married. It's just going to be a bit bit more difficult. I have another friend, and and, um, he was working a job, but he wasn't making enough money, married this girl, lovely girl. She's going to school. And he has to take a second and sometimes a third job just to be able to float. And then she finally finished her school like several months ago, and now she's got a job, and he's just like, thank God, because he can actually relax, you know? But there's different seasons that you go through your life, timing, okay? A lot of guys are not willing to carry the weight for a portion of their, of their marriage. They're just not willing to carry the weight. It's too much. You're not ready to be married. All right, got to be able to separate from your mother and your father. Yeah, make sure you're ready. Secondly, financially, and this is pretty straightforward, can you effectively move out and be a dependent on your own within like a year, year and a half? If not, then you really shouldn't be looking at courting. Finan- financially is, is super important, but um, at the same time, it's exactly what I explained uh, a minute ago um, about those couples that got married. They were able to pull it off, you know, and praise God. That was really awesome. They bought a little condo somewhere, and they just pulled it off, and it was great. Um, and there's different scenarios that you can, you can fulfill but sometimes I hear guys bring this up, and they're just like, you know, Eddie, and, and they have these plans. You know what I mean? Like, like my dad, when he, was, when he was a kid, was telling me this story about how he had two eggs, and he was walking. And he thought he was such a genius because he thought to himself, okay, I have these two eggs. And when they hatch, you know, I have a rooster at home, and then I'm going to multiply eggs. So then in six months, I should have, like, 30 chickens. And then in a year, I should have, like, 120 chickens. And then in 10 years, I'm a millionaire, right? And as he's walking, thinking of the story, he trips and he drops the eggs. Um, <laughs> so, so sometimes I'll talk to these guys, and I'm just like, oh, dude, that's great. You know, are, are, 
I see that you're in this relationship with this girl. Great, you know. Are you guys, you know, planning on getting married? He's like, oh, yeah, man, I got this plan. Look, man, <laughs> if, if there isn't an income coming in or a seriously stable plan, like if you're working in a company, like if you work in trades, and you know that you're going to get a promotion in two years because they have to promote you because you're a part of a union, that's a stable plan. But if you're walking around with eggs in your hand, you got problems, all right? That's, you need more help than a relationship could possibly be. Oh, man. Financially. Thirdly, physically. Um, the Juvenile Justice Factbook, it's, it's just a whole mess of doctors and PhD holders that wrote this. I was looking at the, the cred uh, accreditation. They wrote this. They wrote, during adolescence, the brain begins its final stages of maturization and continues to rapidly develop well into a person's early 20s, concluding around the age of 25. The prefrontal cortex, which gives the executive functions of reasoning, advanced thought, and impulse control, is the final area of the human brain to mature. Kind of makes sense why teenagers are always doing really stupid things, right? Like, you guys, you guys, you kind of grasping this? You know, like, YOLO, ah, go and jump off of something and break an arm and... <laughs> Everybody wants to be there to see the guy jump, but nobody wants to be the guy jumping, you know what I mean? You're just like, oh yeah, dude, do it. Oh, this guy's gonna break his arm, watch. YouTube this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, so physically, the last thing to develop on us as human beings is our frontal cortex, which is where the decision-making and impulse control happens. Wow. As if I couldn't have figured that out on my own <laughs> um, just by looking at people. Um, so look, if you're like 14, you're just not ready to court. I could just make that call from here. That's just easy. Like, oh, hey, I'm 14. And, yeah, no, you just, you just should not be courting, dating, in a relationship. Boys still have cooties at that age. It's contagious. You get a rash on your head. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's all true, by the way. <laughs> um, so if you're physically not ready, if you're just not old enough and you're not mature enough, and you know what, some guys, oh, especially in my age group, it's the Peter Pan generation. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. They're, like, in their 30s or in their late 20s, and they're just still kids. Oh, hey, you have a job? No, but I'm a guild leader in World of Warcraft. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I just leveled up my super elf man or whatever. I don't know. Night elf. Night elf. Thank you. I just leveled up my night elf. <laughs> if you're mentally not ready, or, you know, you, you, ever see, you ever see those girls that they're just so naive? They're so sweet, but, God, they're so naive, and they're just like, yeah, I just got a big fat yes from my guy. Um, you know, they're like the sweetest girls in the world, but they have this like naive mentality of the world and of relationships. And they're just like, I'm just going to be here and I'm going to let my hair hang out the window and my knight in shining armor is going to come riding up on a horse. And if he's not on a horse, then I'm not interested. And, you know, he's just going to show up and he's just going to whisk me away and it's going to be heaven for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? You're probably not ready to date yet. Just be aware of that. Have good, wise friends that will tell you pretty much the same thing. So if you're not physically ready, if you're not spiritually ready is the next one. If you're not spiritually ready for a relationship, you should not be courting. Can I tell you when you're spiritually ready? It's really easy. Oh, man, this is like the easiest one, okay? When you're in good standing with Jesus and he says green light, then you're spiritually ready. It's that simple. When you're in good standing in your relationship with Jesus and he says green light, and that's it. It's just really that simple. I could explain to you day and night about relationships. We could talk about this for hours. I could do a series just about marriage and about what marriage looks like. And, and we would have a grand time and how women think and how men think. And um, like there's this book called Women Are Like Spaghetti and Men Are Like Waffles. Totally true. Um, but that's a conversation for a different day. Um, but the thing is this, is at the end of the day, if you have a relationship with Jesus... He's going to tell you the right time. He's going to tell you if you're ready. He's going to say green light here and now. You know, before I started courting my wife, there was a two-year period where I didn't talk to a single person, like, of the opposite sex. I just wasn't interested. All right? There was a two-year solid period. I remember I was, I was talking to this one girl, and it fell apart, and nobody taught me how to court, so I had my heart attached to her and broke my heart and all of that. And then what happened is I was talking to God about it, and I sat before him, and I remember I was by the little personnel gate in, in my front yard, and I was sitting there, I was kind of pacing back and forth, and I said, you know, I was just thinking of, like, every girl that I'd ever met, like, from the girl, uh, you know, girls at church to the girl that bagged my groceries at Bel Air 20 minutes ago, like, like of every girl ever. 
and I thought to myself, I was like, God, do I even, like, know my wife? Is she, like, right underneath my nose? And, and today she's my friend, and, like, a year from now I'm going to be like, oh, my God, this is the girl I'm going to marry. Or have I not met her? When I see her, am I just going to be like, bam, I know? And these were questions I was asking. I was just talking to God. And God says this to me in the, the politest, sweetest, most gentlest way. And he just said exactly this word for word. He said, Eddie, there is no girl for you. To which I gently replied, what, 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 what? Exactly that many. All right? And then God said the same thing again. And he said, Eddie, there is no girl for you. And I said, God, I don't understand. And this is exactly what he said. He said, Eddie, it's not your time. And until it's your time, there is no girl for you. It was awesome. And I was like, this is how I responded. I said, that makes perfect sense. I said, God, I'm going to take all of these girls that I've been thinking about and all these questions that I've been having, and I'm just going to push them all the way aside, and I'm going to leave it in your hands, and I'm ready to serve you now. And for two years, not a single thought. I just didn't care. And then two years later, she caught my eye. And then a year, a year and one month exactly after that, we got married. And it was fantastic. And I did not have a horse. Go figure. <laughs> so... So if you're spiritually ready, and you know what, look, let me, let me say this. I know, um, I know what some of you are thinking. Yeah, but Eddie, you know, I'm not all of that that you described. So what, should nobody start a relationship with me? Bingo. That's exactly right. That's exactly correct. So what, am I doomed to not be in a relationship forever? No, of course not. You just have to grow into a place to where you're Mr. Right or Mrs. Right. Instead of going around broken and looking for somebody to fulfill that brokenness, when really the only thing that's going to make you healthy is a healthy relationship with Jesus. That's it. It's that simple. So what? I shouldn't court and I shouldn't be in a relationship? No, you shouldn't because you should really grow healthy first. And when you're healthy, then you'll have something to give and something to be able to participate in that relationship with. So that way you can enjoy it the way that God designed it and be able to give God glory through it. Amen? Amen. Pretty straightforward. All right? Yeah. And my wife said, and it'll last. Yeah, it will. What is the divorce rate in this country now? It's like 60 plus percent. It's like some ridiculous number. <sighs> oh, is it? Oh, that's right. The divorce rate is dropping because less people are getting married, so less people are getting divorced. Yeah, that's terrible. That's a lot worse. So... So what does healthy courting look like? Second part of the question. What does a healthy courting process look like? Um, understand this. Healthy courting and healthy relationships begins with healthy people. And healthy people come from a healthy relationship with Jesus. The foundation of a great marriage is a great relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the foundation of a great marriage. Now understand this. I'm not saying the foundation of a marriage, a great marriage, is a ton of knowledge from reading different books on marriage. It's not enough. A healthy marriage isn't from, well, you know, you just got to really just love her and endure. Like these, like, you know, three-cent nuggets of information. Vayubits, bines, avakastoritz. Wow, you know? Or a lot of those marriage sermons that you hear. You're only allowed to love one woman. That's the best advice you got, really? Like, is that such a prevalent problem? <sighs> it was just like an awkward laugh back there. It's like, ha. Ah. <laughs> um, a great relationship in a marriage and a great marriage comes from a great relationship with Christ. Why? Because some mornings God wakes, I wake up and I talk to God in the morning because I try to keep a continual relationship with him. And God will say this, hey, Eddie, see me, I need you to be gentle today. She's just going to have a crazy rough day. And I know to be gentle. And if I don't talk with God, you know what happens? I have a terrible day. I have a terrible day because I'm being assaulted spiritually all day. Not because really the enemy wants to assault me on God knows what. He wants me to get in a fight with my wife. That's the thing. She's being assaulted all day. And I'm thinking I can't wait to get home so that way I can be there and my wife can help me with all of this anger and frustration that I'm dealing with. And she's thinking the same thing about me. And then we meet up at home and I'm just like unload and she goes unload and it's just awkward and uncomfortable and not fun. All right. But a good relationship with Jesus, God prepares my heart for that. God prepares her heart for that. And then we just be Jesus to one another. It's amazing. All right. So what does healthy courting look like? Just kind of skipping a section. Healthy Christians have a healthy prayer life. 
In Ephesians 6, 18, it says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. You don't do anything without talking to Jesus about it because you're in a father-child relationship with your dad, and he's a part of the whole process. It's not like he doesn't know what's really going on in your heart anyways. So listen, to like a boy or to like a girl when you're in a place in your life when marriage is something that's realistic, it's not a bad thing. In fact, it's a godly thing. It's a holy thing. He designed it that way. It's a great thing. It's good to be able to see somebody and be interested in them. Okay, the way that we react on that defines if it's sin or holy. So as, as the process begins, um, first thing you do is you just keep an eye out, all right? You just keep an eye out. You're in constant relationship with Jesus. You're praying. You're walking with him. And the courting process usually begins because somebody catches your eye. I was praying right here for Claudia Oros. Claudia Oros was right here. And I was praying for her because she was like my kid's sister since we were small. She still is. We call each other cousin. And she was here, and she was praying, and I was there, and I saw that she was struggling in prayer because it was an altar call. And I remember I kept on trying to see past, I think it was like Soren Matowitz, he's huge and you can't see past him. And, and I, kept on, I kept on like trying to like see past him, you know, I was just praying for her just to see, you know, where she was in prayer. And at one point in time, I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying. And, I'm praying. and two years had gone by from that first conversation that I had with God. And then I lean over, and I see my wife with her arm around Claudia, and they were praying together. And that was the first time she caught my eye, all right, because I saw her servant heart. And that's where all of that began. And then I started praying about it. What's going to happen in your life is you're going to be doing something, going somewhere. The first thing that's going to catch your eye is usually probably physical. And then after that, you're going to start to get to know their heart. And you're going to have one or two or three different people that you might be praying about, maybe even at the same time. You're not going to be having a relationship with all three of them, but you're praying about it. And you're going, God, look, you know, I just, I just want you to guide me. You know, three years before my wife and I started courting, she had feelings for me, and she prayed about it. And she said, God, if this isn't from you, take these feelings away. And she completely surrendered them to him, and he did. And three years later, they showed back up. And she goes, God, if this isn't from you, take them away. And he didn't, so we got married. It's that simple. <laughs> so then the idea is this is you're watching to see if you're a good fit. You know, in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6.14, it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Over here it's talking about not being unequally yoked with people that aren't Christians, okay? So let's make this pretty easy, pretty fast. When you're trying to weigh out if this person might be a good fit for you, they don't know Jesus, not a good fit. Easy. All right? Needs check. If they claim to be Christian, but just in word and not in deed and their lifestyle totally does not match Jesus, almost just as easy, about five minutes longer until they open their mouth and you realize you're nothing like the guy that I'm in love with, which is my dad and my best friend, Jesus Christ. So that's also pretty easy. Um, if they're Christian and they're not ready for marriage, then the answer is clear again. No, don't court this person. So you can kind of start to check that one off and no you know you can pray for them that god saves their soul absolutely you're supposed to as christians but please don't do this and i see so many girls do this god i will be your little missionary and i will evangelize that guy so that way he'll become a christian for your glory and then i'll marry him and then we'll have like 30 kids and this is the plan um worst idea ever you know what the thing is i have seen i've heard of one relationship i've never seen i've heard of one relationship where she got with him and he wasn't saved and he ended up giving his life to jesus legitimately and then they got married i've heard of one case right have you heard of more than one mike okay i've heard of one because we talk about relationships all the time it's just kind of what we like to do for like the last decade i swear um yeah uh, I've heard of one case. I've seen dozens, seen, physically seen, and, and, and observed my friends, dozens of relationships where that happens, and they both get sucked into sin. Listen, if a guy is going to come to church for you, then you have actively made yourself the Messiah. You don't have the ability to save people. It doesn't work that way. You can't be his personal savior. He needs Jesus. She needs Jesus. If she's only coming to church because she's interested in you, then she's not really interested in Jesus and she's never going to meet with him. 
And how long do you think that's going to last? Oh, you know, he's coming to church. He's a good guy. He's got a good job. You know, so let's get married. You guys get married. What, you think he's going to still come to church? What for? He got you. That's what he had to do to get you. Mission accomplished. Done. So that doesn't function. So what you're doing is, is in the courting process, we begin with <sighs> keeping a dynamic prayer life open with Jesus. Secondly, checking, you know, keeping an eye out. Obviously, you're praying about it. Jesus points somebody out to you. That's fantastic, okay? But maybe two or three people catch your eye. Well, you're, you're spending time with them in groups somewhere else outside and making sure that you're not going to be unequally yoked That somebody who doesn't love Jesus. Or I would even use the, the term unequally yoked, even though that's not what the verse is talking about. I would even use the term um, uh, unequally yoked in this way. If you're the kind of Christian that you're like hardcore dedicated and you know you're going to spend your life in missions, and the person that you're interested in, and they're just like, man, you know, they don't really come to church. They're involved. They come on like Christmas and Easter, but they do have a relationship with Jesus technically. You're not going to have a good marriage at all, almost ever, all right, because you're headed in two different directions. Now, can you imagine that? Like, like imagine two oxen tied up, and one wants to go that way, and one wants to go this way. Or if one person is just not ready to make a relationship, they just want intimacy but no commitment. One oxen's looking to move while the other one's looking to stand still. It's just going to fall apart. So just be aware of that. Um, <laughs> I like this. If they seem to be a good fit and always mentioned, then something happens, okay? Um, is it a sin for a girl? So, so if, if the person that you're courting seems to be a, a good fit, then something happens, and I'm about to explain what's about to happen, okay? Yeah, so is it a sin for a girl... I'll read it exactly how I wrote it. To put herself intentionally in a guy's path just to be noticed. Like to go out of her way to be noticed and put herself in a guy's path. No. Huh? That's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you wh why. Because uh, Ruth did, all right, in the Bible. Ruth chapter 3. <laughs> Not that one. <laughs> well, that just got awkward quick. So check it out. Ruth chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Half of you gasped. It was awesome. That's when I knew. I just hear a, a silence and a gasp, and I was like, wait, what? No, not that Ruth. Okay. So Ruth chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Now it happened at midnight, now it happened at midnight that the man, Boaz, was startled and turned himself. And there... A woman was laying at his feet, and he said, who are you? She answered, isn't this like the cutest answer you've ever heard? Check this out. He goes, who are you? And she says, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing. That's like the cutest thing ever. Can you imagine that? Like, like, like if, if, a, if a guy was, you know, interested in courting a girl, and, and he's just like, hey, I'm interested in you, and we start praying about this, right? And she says, okay, take me under your wing. That's like the cutest thing ever. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Andrew literally facepalmed. Literally facepalmed. <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's totally corny, but it's honest. Uh, I can be corny. I'm married. Nah. I'm probably like the most kissy-faced, googly-eyed husband in this church. Yeah. Thank you, Justin, from the sound booth. Okay, so Ruth goes and puts herself in Boaz's path. You know how it is with guys, all right? Let me just give you a, a little bit of information for those of you that don't know. We are oblivious to signals. Oblivious to signals. I'll never forget, I was a kid, and my mom changed the mini blinds to her bedroom. She has these two huge windows at this house. We used to live in North Highlands. Huge windows. And in her bedroom, she changed them because I guess what was in style then was like that, that rose, that deep burgundy, you know? And they had these like deep burgundy mini blinds on the south side. Some of you are remembering that growing up in your like parents' houses. Okay. On the south side of the house, meaning that that's where the sun set. At nighttime, it would make their room red like this. Every evening, their room was solid red. Like, you walked in, you were like, oh, my God. My dad would come home from work every single day, take off his shoes, eat, and then go to sleep. It was in the evening. He would come home, take off his shoes in the red room. Two weeks went by before he noticed. All right? <laughs> it's just, he's just like, oh, I skim on camera. I'm like, oh, my God, we are that bad. We are terrible at noticing things. Okay? Ruth was picking up 
wheat in this guy's field for who knows how long. And I mean, I don't know what else she must have done. She's eventually got to go and lay down like at the foot of his bed and he wakes up in the middle of the night. And, like he practically tripped over her. It's like, oh, there's a human being here. What do you want? Hey, we should, you know, hook up. Oh, okay. <laughs> you do, do you understand what happened here? We're oblivious, okay? So what I'm saying to you is, is it is it wrong for a girl to put herself in somebody's, you know, peripheral vision? No. But I do want to explain something. And I might answer your question, actually. I do want to explain something. Are there limits? God, yes. If you're climbing into somebody's bed, that's really creepy, all right? <laughs> like, like if somebody's coming to go to sleep and there's just like, like a hump at the foot of the bed, you know, just like a bump, you're just like... <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just awkward. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. You would be a stalker is what would happen. Yeah. So let me give you some suggestions about what I am talking about, okay? And, and I think that might answer your question or no? Okay. Do share. All right. So, um... Here's, here's some suggestions of ways that you can put yourself in his peripheral, all right? Um, when, you know how, like, on, on Sunday nights, all of the youth go out together, and they eat, and they're, like, at a table of 30? Make sure that you're sitting next to him or across from him so that way you can have a conversation. So that way the only thing that he's got to look at is pretty much you, all right? Get in his peripheral. Do you understand? If the guy is, is on, on the drama team or on the youth, he's, he's in the youth choir, all of a sudden you just love choir, all right? That's totally okay. <laughs> All right? Oh, he's in orchestra. I happen to love playing the bassoon. So I'm going to join. <laughs> and you know what I mean? All right? <laughs> I do know what a bassoon is, actually. A friend of mine played it. That's why I know. You know, get involved in ministry events where, where they're involved. Um, youth conferences, Peniel, retreats, missions, visiting the sick ministries, et cetera. Those are all great, per, great places, all right? I was listening uh, to a pastor preach. His name's Tom Nelson. Great, great, great preacher, and he was preaching on Song of Solomon. I was listening through the series, and he said that he was with Campus Crusade, and every Saturday, him and the guys and all the people from Campus Crusade, they would play football. And he said um, that what happened one day is they were, they were playing football, and she was always on the opposite team because she's smart, and... Um, Sorry, I stepped on a huge spider. You're okay. Okay, so he would, she would always get on the opposite team. And what happened is one day she was coming across for a pass, and she sprained her ankle. And then he helped her back off to the sideline because he was the only one nearby because she was a genius. And, and they, you know, he's like, hey, do you need a ride home? And then, you know, they kind of started talking from there and so on. And he says this at the end. He goes, but, you know, I always wondered about that sprained ankle, <laughs> if she really sprained it or not. I don't know. Anyways, I just thought it was really, really cute. Um, yeah, so listen, putting yourself in his crosshairs, definite next way, next step. But listen carefully. Please understand two things. Number one, you're praying through all of this. You're letting God lead you through all of this. You're letting the Holy Spirit lead you through all of this. And number two, you're guarding your heart. All right? Some of you guys, and this specifically kind of tends to fall in the girls' camp a little bit more, you guys kind of tend to plan ahead like way ahead, oh, hey, you have nice hair. Oh, my God, I wonder what we'll name our kids. <laughs> I like the name Kyle, you know, like, uh, that's a hideous name. Okay. Um, guard your heart. You know, like Ani was saying, like the drama said, guard your heart for out of it flows the wellspring of life. Listen carefully. What happens is, you know how last week you talked about, you know, you got to try it before you buy it, and it would make more sense if you literally gave like your hand with every car that you test drove because you're actually giving a part of yourself in a relationship? Don't get your heart attached to anything, all right? Be, be able, how we talked about last week, to be able to, to walk away and to say, you know what, if this doesn't work out, I still want to be able to show up at your wedding and hopefully hook you up with, with somebody that you're eventually going to marry and we could be good friends for the rest of our lives. That's a healthy courting process because you don't give yourself away because you guard your heart, all right? So we're at this place, and, and if it's the girl, you're putting yourself in his crosshairs. If it's the guy, see, for the girl, it's hard because she's got to put herself in the crosshairs. For the guy, you don't have to, but there is something else you have to do. You're the one who has to initiate, meaning this. Yeah. Ask her out to coffee, 
and you guys go out to coffee and you sit down and then you're very deliberate and clear on your intentions and you go, look, I'm interested in you uh, and more than just friends and I hope you're interested in me. And that makes you vulnerable, but listen carefully. It's the guy's job to be vulnerable because it's the guy's job to lead. 1 Corinthians 11.9 and Genesis 2.18 talk about that. I'm not going to um, read the scriptures just because we're, we're about four minutes past. But realize this. It's the guy's job to lead. So it's his job to say, hey, I'm interested in you. Now, here's the danger with that. If, if you've misread the signs because you're a guy like every guy and you could misread everything because you're always confused in relationships, um, true story, um, what could happen is you could be like, hey, I'm interested in you and I hope you're interested in me. And the girl could be like, oh, no, not at all. I'm actually married and this is really uncomfortable or something, you know, like we could miss that. You understand this? Yeah, why is she at the coffee shop? I know, you're all wondering. But it's, it's the guy's job to lead, all right? So here's, here's what I wrote, and then after this, I got one more point. The two of you, yeah, so you tell her that you want to court her and that you want to get to know if she's the right fit for you and if you're the right fit for her. So then one thing happens right after that, and that's where you guys make a plan, okay? In Ephesians 6.18, it talks about con- keep continually keeping a prayer life. Matthew 6.16, Jesus says, and when you fast, and he describes how you fast, a great idea might be to be able to set, and you guys are doing this together, to set this courting time, because now you've begun courting. You set this courting time like this, and you go, look, l- I'm, I'm going to continue praying about this, and I hope you'll join me in that. And let's pick a day a week when the both of us are going to fast and pray about this. Um, it also says, in Genesis 4, 7, it says, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. How do you master sin? Through the power of the Holy Spirit, through discipline and through self-control by being obedient to the Holy Spirit through his strength, okay? So what that means is just this, is you're going you're gonna to know that you're a sinner and she's a sinner and that you guys need to make some pre-choice choices and set some boundaries. Let me give you some examples. Like here's boundaries that I've heard from other couples that are uh, recording and, and what it means to me that we're recording and they're great 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 examples like number one never be alone in private places period ever period it's just it's just like the most worst scenario you could ever do and you know what young people tell me they tell me this you know eddie i just couldn't control myself yeah you could if your dad was right there would you be able to control yourself god yes <laughs> all right if, you, if you're about to do something sinful and like frata la moisa walks in you would be sfunt do you understand you just like erupt in song you, you know what I mean? Like, it would just, you know, contum, contum, she, you know what I mean? <laughs> Something would happen, all right? So you have the ability to control that, all right? It, it's there. But listen, don't put yourself in needless scenarios. So never be alone in private places. That's, a, like, one of my favorite pieces of advice. Another one is we know that whatever we feed grows. So if you're on the phone with each other for, like, four hours a day, what do you think is going to grow? An uncontrollable desire to take this further. You know, you might want to set a limit and say, hey, look, we'll talk every evening because I'm busy at school and I'm busy at work and you're busy. We'll talk every evening at 10 o'clock for like, you know, 30, 40 minutes, you know, and that's okay. But we're going to set breaks on that. Why? Because I'm going to guard my heart. And as a man, I'm going to help you guard yours because that's part of my job. I lead. I'm the spiritual head. Okay. Amen. Uh, Another great piece of advice is, you know, never talk after midnight. Why? Because when there's for the same reason why you don't meet in private places. Because there's no accountability after midnight. Nobody's going to walk in your room. Uh, Never send, this is a new one, never send any photos at all, period, across the cell phone because that can get way out of hand. Amen? Amen. So create boundaries for yourselves. 1 Peter 5, 8, you guys know this verse well. Be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So just be aware of that and then guard your hearts out of Proverbs 4, 23. And then one of two things happen. Either one, you guys go, hey, this doesn't really work out, and what I want isn't really what you want, and this doesn't match and meet up, and I've been praying about it, and God's been kind of telling me to, you know, pull off. So here's what we're going to do is we're just going to break from here, and we're going to remain friends, and I'm really glad that you were, you know, a part of this journey with me, and that's it. And it's done, and you guys are still friends. Or two, you get married, and you spend the rest of your life together. Does that sound cool? All right, I invite you to stand. So I hope that that was... Um, insightful and that it covered a lot of that. Um,